changing the world of work for women everywhere. We are Watermark. We're the only nonprofit women's leadership organization that spans all industries. We connect, develop, and advocate for the advancement of women in the workplace. I moved my family three times, and I moved them out of the Bay Area. And people said to me, oh my God, that's so risky. You can never come back. And I go, yes, you can, when you save your money, when you live below your means, when you can make decisions and walk out of crappy situations, walk out of companies that are not a good fit for you, when you know you've got something in the bank to tie you over to the next opportunity. And so that's some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about pitfalls, roadblocks that may happen to you and your career, and the importance of financial man management, and dealing with things like divorce that you may not have expected, but planning ahead through an expert like Laura Wasser uh, will be very, very helpful, I think, uh, to all of us. So with that, I would love to introduce Nicole Mossman, who's the Managing Director of BlackRock here tonight, and we're so delighted to have you help us with this event tonight. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be really brief because we want to, I want to turn this over to Laura, but I just wanted to give um, kind of a quick uh, background. Um, the partnership that we have with Watermark is really special to us. Um, I head up one of our uh, WIN committees here at BlackRock um, that we've newly formed in the last year um, that is very much focused on connecting externally. And um, I've had the great pr privilege of working with Watermark in the last year and specifically with Aaron and Marlene and Kate Brian and Ann and, and a lot of folks here and it's um, the as you've heard Marlene kind of articulate the focus and the mission that Watermark has it so clearly aligns with what we are focused on here which is being able to very much empower our women at BlackRock and actually be able to do that within the community as well and so we are very focused on empowering and connecting and being able to um, lift up our, our women and Laura is I, I had the, the pleasure of, of speaking with her um, before the event uh, started as well and so we are very honored tonight to be able to host this event um, and be able to hear some great tips from Laura on being able to not only prepare ourselves if we were ever to be in a situation um, where we had to face possibly going through divorce I personally have gone through it myself um, but have come out the other side in a very positive way. But if there are pitfalls, how to be able to kind of rise above and, and be able to kind of empower ourselves. So we're going to first see kind of a short video and then turn it over to, to Laura. So please, please welcome Laura. Divorce sucks. I'm Laura Wasser and I've been a family law attorney, which is kind of a euphemism for a divorce lawyer, in Southern California for 23 years. My podcast is going to first air on iTunes on April 1st. Part of what we're talking about on the podcast is breakups and more importantly, starting over. I thought it was quite constructive in that it covered a number of different aspects. It's not just divorces, it's how to be nice to yourself, take care of yourself, something on the go, you can put your headphones in and it can center you. And we all want to listen to something that inspires us. I started It's Over Easy, which is an online platform that allows you to do it yourself for people that want to read about divorce, read about child custody, read about support. I love the idea of it being a podcast. I want to be a guest on that podcast. Divorce sucks. Bet you didn't know it doesn't have to be that way. Cool. <laughs> okay. So that's me. So I, um, I have been a practicing family law attorney, I guess, which is a euphemism for a divorce attorney <laughs> for about 25 years. I grew up in Southern California. I went to school up here at Cal. I have been married. I have been divorced. I have two kids. Neither of them were from that marriage. Both of them were from two different dads to whom I was not married. Um, I was saying to Nicole before, I received child support from one dad and I pay child support to the other dad. Dad one said to me a few weeks ago, why don't I just cut you out and pay my check directly to this guy? I am, um, 
very financially secure as a result of practicing for 25 years and being a managing partner at a 17-person law firm that does very high wealth divorce. So I have seen an array of different people, women and men, going through whatever the human nature evolution of their dissolution is. And I've also seen what happens with them financially and how it works. You know, the very top creme de la creme producer or movie star's wife that could get a reservation at any table in Beverly Hills or West Hollywood that goes into Neiman Marcus or Saks Fifth Avenue or Barney's and the stylist is there. Mrs. So-and-so, I've got this, you Saint Laurent for you, I've got this and, and this Gucci and this Prada. And when she comes in, she says, I'm so embarrassed to be saying this. I, I don't even have any credit cards in my own name. And I don't know how much our mortgage is. And I don't know what we spend every month. And I feel like such an idiot. And I said, well, look, here's the good news. You're never going to feel this way again. What I have decided in my life and my practice is to start talking about what happens when you go first into a relationship with somebody that you're going to have what is a contract with, and then what happens if you have to come out the other side of it, and what happens after that. I think it's important. Um, candidly, I bill $850 an hour, and I still kind of scratch my head and go, God, I hope I'm saying something good during those <laughs> four, those, four <laughs> you know, phone calls. Um, there will always be high conflict, complex litigation for myself and my colleagues, but I do believe that for people who are of a certain demographic and, and wealth range and age range and tech savvy range, there's a better way of doing it. And I also believe that eventually there'll be a better way of doing it for everyone. But perhaps more importantly, what just stupefies me is that in 2018, the end of 2018, we are still treating divorce like a Kramer v. Kramer. Some of you might be too young to even know what that means, but like it's still this taboo thing. Don't get me wrong, not fun, not encouraging it, not going, hey, you happy? You think maybe we could, no, no. But it is happening, and if it's happening, there has to be a better way of doing it. So now let's rewind to before you even get married. So many people come to me and they have no idea what they entered into when they either moved in with or walked down the aisle with somebody. So I think that Aaron sent out questions to some of you, or maybe all of you, uh, earlier this week. Raise your hand if you are married. Okay. Raise your hand if you're married and you have a prenuptial agreement. Okay. Raise your hand if you are cohabiting. And by the way, there is no such word as cohabitating, okay? Please don't say that. It's cohabiting, okay? Okay. Do you have a cohabitation agreement? Okay. So here's the thing. If you get married to someone more so than cohabiting, you are entering into a contract. And when you enter into that contract, it's a legal contract. You're, you probably got married, you had, you picked your venue, you paid for the venue, you picked your caterer, you paid for the caterer, you picked your florist, and your cake maker, and your dressmaker, and your, you know, string quartet, and it was probably lovely. I hope it was lovely. But all of those guys you had contracts with, you are entering into a contract that says, in this state, when I marry you, everything I earn and everything I create, if I paint a painting or I sculpt a sculpture or I write a screenplay or a song, and my nine to five hourly wages, and you're going, yeah, right, lady, I'm really working nine to five. I'm working so much more than nine to five. I've had to get out of work to get here. Is going to be split equally with your spouse if and when you split up. And if you are the breadwinner in your marriage, you will also be paying your spouse when you split up spousal support. And if and when you split up, you will be paying your spouse child support if he or she earns less money than you do and you share the children. Now people say to me, well, I'm the mom, so of course I'm going to get the kids. So many women have come to me and said, so I've been working my ass off for the past 15 years. We both went to grad school together, we were superstars, and then he decided he wanted to write a screenplay and he's been on the couch for the past 15 years. And by the way, I still am paying a full-time nanny and a full-time weekend babysitter, so it's not like he's a stay-at-home dad. I'm gonna be writing him a check? And I'm like, yeah, you are. 
and I'm going to be giving him half the money that I earned during this time period? Yeah, you are. And the screenplay that I wrote four years ago, if it sells, he gets half of that? Yeah, he does. How about my retirement? That's mine, right? No. I'm not saying that's not okay. I'm just saying, don't you kind of need to know about that when you're going into it? There's plenty of people that say, I'm good with that, and I want to cast my lot with this person, and I, that's the deal, and I'm okay, and that would be the deal if the genders were reversed, and I'm fine with it. And there's plenty of people that go, hell no, I'm not good with that. I don't like that law. That doesn't make sense for me. I've worked too hard to get where I am. Let's, now that I know the law, figure out a way to kind of contract around that. It's so not sexy and romantic. I mean, it really isn't. How do I bring that up? How, where does that come up? And is he going to think I'm like being a ball buster or I'm going to be I'm being too aggressive and maybe he's going to leave me? Well, good. If that's what he thinks, then bye bye. Um, and by the way, same sex couples too. If that's what she thinks, then bye bye to her too. It, 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 you need to have the conversations. There's also plenty of things that could be discussed in this kind of idea of pre marriage cohabitation contract that is not necessarily something that's going to go on a prenup. Hey, I'm thinking I might be having kids in a few years. If I take a year or two off, how's that going to look? Or how much are we going to be saving for our retirement every year? Let's talk about that. Not sexy, I know, but I want to make sure that at a certain point we can go travel through Europe and do this and do that. When are we going to buy a house? This housing market situation up in the Bay Area is kind of freaking me out. How much are we putting aside? How is your credit? Do you have student loans? These are conversations that need to be had. Not sexy, not romantic, they shouldn't be. But I will tell you this, in the 25 years that I've been practicing as a family law attorney and as in the prenups that I've done, very few of those people have come back and gotten divorced. Now, it hasn't been fun negotiating the prenups, but having those conversations, I believe, has kept those people together because it really is saying, look, we're going to go through a lot together, I hope. And if we are going to go through a lot together, maybe we should have these conversations. Now, cohabitation is a different story. If you're going to move in with somebody, that's probably okay. You don't automatically get rights to anything. But again, another question I think Aaron sent out is, how many people in this room have been kind of the victim of some kind of either fiscal nefariousness or irresponsibility or recklessness? Has someone stolen your credit card identity theft and used it? Raise your hands. That's fun, right? Getting out of that situation. Have you abdicated your finances to somebody else, whether it be a business manager or a significant other, and had them kind of not do a great job and all of a sudden be like, oh shit, how did this happen? Anybody? Not so much, not yet. Okay, watch. And again, <laughs> have you yourself gotten into a situation where you're like, how did my bill get so high? I don't understand. I mean, I really like these shoes, but I don't know if they're worth it, and now it's going to hurt next month. And my feet hurt too, but anyway. <laughs> these are things. <laughs> These are things that we need to think about. And again, as, as you said, as we are becoming more fiscally responsible, as we are becoming more secure, I, I am lucky enough to be friends with many, many younger women. I have an amazing younger Pilates instructor, an amazing masseuse. I have women that work for me that help me with my kids. And all of them kind of, you know, uncomfortably come in and say, what do you think about this? Or what? And I say, dude, you need to make sure that no matter what, you are never in a situation where you cannot support yourself. Because then you will have the clarity to know, is this real? Now again, I went to Cal, like I said, and I had a lot of really, really bright, bright women friends that could have done anything. And many of them decided what I want to do, because I'm so damn bright, is marry this wealthy guy. And they're very happy. They had a couple kids. They are in control of their family's finances. It's all good. I've had some other friends that decided that they wanted to go in a different direction and they went after their careers and they never had kids and now they're in their 50s going, I'm not sure that I made the right choice. We, right now, have the benefit of going, what do we want? Can we have it all? Yeah, we can. We can have it all. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. It is a balance. 
I said to, I have a 14 year old and an eight year old boy and, and I've always said to them like it's, sometimes I feel like I'm riding a unicycle and I'm juggling plates. And the other day my kid came in, I was saying to some of the women here, I'm Jewish and so yesterday was Yom Kippur, so my office was closed. I wasn't in temple and I didn't fast, but anyway, I'm kind of <laughs> chill for the day. I thought about things that we could really go into next year and make us better people. But my 14 year old, while that was happening, was dyeing his hair pink. Okay, so he came home, and then we had to go to the break fast with his grandmother, and he had pink hair. And when he walked in, I was like, Really, Luke? Really? And he goes, Some of the plates are falling, aren't they? <laughs> But that's what it's about. It's about having, and then, and, and, and I was also saying to some of them that my, my mother is a very intelligent woman, and when my parents split up when I was about 16, they were both attorneys, and they did it in the most respectable, civil, educated way, because they both knew the law, and they both knew what would happen if they had to, you know, spend a great deal of money and energy on just negativity. So they did it in a really good way, and that was the example I saw, both personally and professionally. But my mom, in February, was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Okay, <laughs> right? Bunny, she lives in Malibu, she's amazing, she's gorgeous. She had me when she was 22 years old, so she was always like a hot mom, but she never acted like a hot mom. She never flirted with any of my friends. She was incredibly hot. So anyway, she's diagnosed, and so it's kind of a shock to all of us. My son Luke, with the pink now hair, gets bar mitzvahed back in May, and Bunny shows up. She got really frustrated that her hair had been falling out, so she shaved her head and she got a big tattoo on the back of her scalp, as, which is a heart that says H plus B, which is Howard plus Bunny, which is a, a way of telling you guys that if you're a badass, and if you are getting control of your situation, and you probably don't have to shave your head and get a tattoo on it, you're gonna do what you need to do. And so that has been, a, she's always been a huge example for me, but that was yet another example of how when you are faced with something that you may not think you have a great deal of control over, pivot and find a way to get control over it. The, the tattoo and the head shaving didn't take the cancer away. And she's actually doing really well because again, mind, body, wellness, great attitude, maybe living on the beach in Malibu doesn't hurt, all were helpful to her. And when my kid walked in with his pink hair last night to the breakfast, she didn't even bat an eye. She was like, nice, high-fived him. So again, it's all acceptance, it's all putting things in perspective, it's all relativity and how it works. I believe that we, in 2018, can change the way that we look at not only how we talk about divorce, which is why we created It's Over Easy, but how we talk about getting into the relationships in the first place and how we talk about money. It's not a dirty thing to talk about. I did a, I guess it wasn't a poll, but it was a raise your hand type of a thing at a women's conference that I was at in April. And I said, how many of you talk to your women friends about sex? Every hand in the room went up pretty much. How many of you talk to your women friends about money? Me. I mean, again, it's not that I don't want to sit down at a table with a glass of Chardonnay and talk about money. I want to talk about sex. But at the <laughs> same time, if we're not having conversations about things that will really affect us, I don't know how much sex conversations are going to affect us the next day, but if you know what your peers are doing and what they're spending and what, more particularly, they're doing when they're having conversations with their significant others and we're bringing it to the surface, then these are conversations that will become more a part of our vernacular, more part, more acceptable to have, and then it'll be easier to sit down with your significant other. You got a great ring. You've got you know an idea for when you might be wanting to get married. He says, "So, what do you think about a prenup?" Now, his or her response to that will be very telling. If him or her says, or he or she says, "Fuck that," then what do you do? What does that say to you? How do you process that? Most of the time, you or she will say, I'm totally good with that, I'll sign anything, I love you so much, just put it in front of me, whatever it is. Three months later, when they have the actual document, that may be a different story. And again, there's a sense of entitlement that comes with, I think, in my opinion, younger people, but I'm sure my older people would have said that that came with me too. You don't just get the money, you don't get just get to be married and all of a sudden get it. Talk about it. If you are marrying somebody younger or less accomplished in their finances, again, just so that everybody knows, if you've inherited money, or if you've already earned the money, or if the money was a gift, that's your separate property anyway. 
but your ongoing earning capacity. And by the way, if you're going to inherit a great deal of money and then you're going to be spending that on lifestyle, that'll come later for support. So there's, again, I can't explain it all to you today. You can listen to it and hear what you need to go look up later. Come to it's over easy. Understand what it is and understand that it's not a dirty thing to talk about. I don't really think it's that boring. I think it's just uncomfortable. And talking about some of those uncomfortable things and addressing it as though it's not a failure or a precursor or harbinger to divorce really is a very healthy way of getting into a relationship. Um, again, I feel very strongly that these conversations need to be had. That's why we created It's Over Easy. That's why we started the Divorce Sucks podcast. That's why I wrote the book. It doesn't have to be that way. I believe that I was going to say the time has come, but I think the time came probably 20 years ago that these discussions come out in the open. And again, I think that we as women are the ones that probably, and you two guys and you, Johnny, are the ones that need to start having them. Because until they do, they're just buried. And I think any of us who have kids or are planning on having kids have that responsibility to our children to do it in a better way. So I've been rambling on for a while. Does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff?